The question before us tonight is, did Jesus' original disciples die as martyrs for their faith? And if they did, what is the historical evidence? So that's what I, I really want to uh, hose you down with evidence. Uh, that's what I'm going to be doing tonight. Um, but let, let me ask, you know, why is it important to demonstrate that Jesus' disciples, his original disciples, died for their faith versus just really any Christian over the last 2,000 years? For example, um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer that died as a martyr. What's different about Paul and, and James and um, Peter versus Bonhoeffer or, you know, actually hundreds of thousands of martyrs in places like China, places like Iran, places all around the world today as Christians die for the faith? What's the difference? Another one, you think about 9-11, what's the difference between the 9-11 hijackers flying themselves into, into buildings, sincerely, clearly believing what, they, what they're doing is right and before God. So they died for their beliefs very clearly, right? And, and they were clearly sincere. What's the difference between them dying for their faith and the original disciples dying for their faith? And I would say all the difference in the world. All the difference in the world. And here's why. Peter, James, John, Paul, go down the list. These original disciples, the ones who knew Jesus, they were in a place, not like the Muslim hijackers, not like, you know, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer even. He believed that he was dying for the Lord. The, the hijackers believed they were doing the right thing. But James and Peter and John and Paul, these are people who were in a place to know for certainty whether or not Jesus was who he claimed to be and whether or not he did come back from the dead, whether or not he did rise again from the dead. You see the difference? They were in a place where they could know, right? They could, check, they could check on this. So if we can show that these original disciples believed Jesus rose from the dead and died as martyrs maintaining that belief, then that is compelling evidence, not necessarily that Jesus rose from the dead. That doesn't prove that he rose from the dead. But it does prove that these earliest disciples were absolutely convinced that he rose from the dead. You see? And so then you have to deal, as I'll explain later, with the same uh, trilemma from C.S. Lewis. They were either liars, they were crazy, they believed that Jesus rose from the dead, but he really didn't, or they were telling the truth. He really did rise from the dead. That's what you get to if you can demonstrate this with the original disciples, which uh, I think you can. And this is just one significant piece, as Alan shared, about the evidence for the fact that Jesus of Nazareth did rise from the dead. This is just one significant piece, the fact that the earliest disciples did die for their faith, alongside many other historical pieces that all come together to make a cumulative case, and I would say an overwhelmingly compelling case, that Jesus of Nazareth did rise again from the dead. Other things that we could do separate talks on other times would be, of course, the certainty of Jesus' death, the fact that he died on the cross, uh, crucified under Pontius Pilate, the empty tomb, the fact that the tomb was empty, um, the origin of the disciples' belief, that's kind of what we're going to talk about today, not, not fully, but the fact that the disciples believed, not that he did rise from the dead, but that they believed he rose from the dead and appeared to him, the transformation of Jewish customs in Jerusalem, the very place where Jesus was crucified. I mean, you had all these thousands of Jews start worshiping on Sunday rather than Saturday. Why would they do that? Start uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper, thinking of the body, uh, thinking of the bread and the wine as uh, the body and the blood of Jesus rather than remembering the Exodus and the Passover, which the Jews had done for 1,500 years. What can account for this transformation of so many customs? And you could go on and on in that. And then just the explosive movement that resulted from a dead Messiah. And there were many dead Messiahs, if you didn't know that. There were a lot of dead Messiahs in the first century. N.T. Wright, one of these books, he, he illustrates 11 so-called messiahs, people who claimed to be the messiah, gathered a group of followers, and then died. And guess what happened after they died? So did the movement. The movement died. Dead messiahs aren't fun to follow. It, it, it ended. And so what, what was it about Jesus? What happened? What was different there? But the, those are separate issues, but th this is, they all come together to make a, a cumulative case, I would say. Let me, uh, what Alan said, I might skip a few things just to make sure we have more interaction and more time because I want to make sure we can uh, talk. But, but let me first talk about the problem, the, the problem when it comes to the evidence. You're going to start reading this. Stop that. All right, let's go back here. Um, I went to the wrong place. I'm going to skip one slide, so I'm going to do that right. 
We don't have, I'm going to show you that I'm a skeptic too. There's nothing wrong with being a skeptic. It's a good thing to be a skeptic. It's a good thing to, to challenge the evidence and look at it and see what's true. We don't have strong evidence that all Jesus' disciples did die for uh, their faith. Or even, we don't know what happened. Of course, they died, but we don't know ultimately what happened and how they died. But the problem is, as many Christian apologists, and going all the way back to this famous book, the Fox Book of Martyrs, you might have heard of this, which is a great book, but... The problem with this book, as you'll see if you, if you open it up, and the first list of martyrs, it basically lists martyrs going all the way from the, the original disciples all the way to, I think, 16th century or 15, uh, 17th century when, when this was originally written. But if you notice, it lists these disciples, and I'll just give you one example. Andrew, one of the twelve, right? This is what it says. Andrew was the brother of Peter. Tradition, tradition says he preached the gospel to many Asiatic nations and was martyred in Edessa by being crucified on an X-shaped cross, which came to be known as St. Andrew's Cross. Okay, he says that. Tradition says. All right. That's not going to pass very well. Most scholarly journals, papers, books, tradition says isn't the best evidence. And he doesn't cite anything about it. He just says this, right? Take it up. A little bit later, famous apologist, of course, I respect him greatly, Josh McDowell, but he falls into the same trap. In chapter 5 of this famous book, More Than a Carpenter, it's called, Would You Die for a Lie? And here he lists, and you can look at this afterwards, 1 through 12, he lists the, 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 the 12 apostles, and after each name he has crucified, Andrew, crucified, Matthew, the sword, John, natural death, J James, son of Alphaeus, crucified, Philip, crucified, but no references. Nothing. Just, just says what happened to them. How do, how do we know this? How do we know they, they died this way? And then an even more popular and an even more recent one, Case for Christ, J.P. Moreland, who was interviewed by Lee Strobel, this is what he says in regards to this issue. He says, The apostles were willing to die for something they had seen with their own eyes and touched with their own hands. They were in a unique position not just to believe Jesus rose from the dead, but to know for sure. I agree with them thus far. Then he says, and when you've got 11 credible people with no ulterior motives, with nothing to gain and a lot to lose, who all agree they observed something with their own eyes, now you've got something dif some, some difficulty explaining that away. You see what he did? He went to 11, he says 11, who ended up dying for their faith. But no evidence. Lee Strobel doesn't even challenge him on this. What's the evidence that the 11 died for their faith? You see? And that, this is examples of, I think, the problem and to go on the other extreme from, so you got one extreme, Fox Book of Martyrs, Josh McDowell. The other extreme would be the mo a most recent book. She was actually on O'Reilly, on the O'Reilly Factor recently. Uh, you, can, you can look it up on YouTube. It's a fun discussion about early Christianity and things. But, uh, but she is basically challenging the idea that Christians really were persecuted for the first 300 years. And she is so skeptical that she actually spends about like a page talking about the, the main disciples I'm going to talk about, Peter, James, and Paul. She doesn't even deal with all the evidence. She doesn't even deal with half the evidence that I'm going to present. And she just dismisses it at all. Oh, these are legends too. So she's beyond skeptical and they're beyond accepting, right? So like most things, the truth lies in the middle. You know, the truth lies somewhere in the middle. And that's where I'm going to, to try to show and try to present that we do have strong historical evidence all the disciples might have died for the faith, and I, I think they probably did. I, I personally just believe that. But, but what do we have evidence for? What can we prove with historical evidence? And I would say we can prove it with three of them. And that's Peter, James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul. These are the three I think we do have strong historical evidence that did die uh, for their faith. So. So the other ones, I mean, it's, it's more of like really late. Right? Late tradition. So we, we all of them, it does say eventually, in fact, yeah. this guy right here, Eusebius, who's writing around the same time of the Council of Nicaea, he was there at the Council of Nicaea, Eusebius, he's the first person to sit down and go, okay, let me tell the, the history of the church from the apostle, from Jesus all the way to my present day, which is early 300s. And he tells the story of how all the, the 12 disciples and each one did die in a certain way. But... You know, when you study Eusebius, you can't trust him all the time. He, he's not the most trustworthy on some things. Uh, you know, he's not perfect. He's not scripture. And so I, I, I don't know if I can fully trust him on when he says, you know, Andrew died on an X-shaped cross and things like that. I don't, I don't know. I don't have good, solid, early evidence for that. But I think, so we do have statements that they did all die, but it's later. That's exactly right. Anything else just right now before I start looking at, we start looking at the evidence of the three? All right. 
Oh, and I did want to say, uh, I, I wanted to show a video, but, you know, to, uh, lack of time, but I'll maybe I'll post it on the FB, the, the Facebook uh, uh, thing. But the, it's the first debate between Michael Lacona and Bart Ehrman. And they actually have a discussion on this issue in that debate, and they are, they are in agreement. Bart Ehrman agrees with Lacona that Peter and Paul did die for their faith. They did die as martyrs. He says, yes, the evidence is compelling. And so I say that not because Bart Ehrman says it makes it true, but just to show you that, uh, and it is a fact, that virtually it's, it's virtually unanimous among liberal and conservative scholars together coming, on a, coming to a consensus on these, on these three people, that James... Uh, uh, Peter and Paul. Ehrman doesn't mention James, but I'm pretty confident he would say James di would died for his faith as well. But, uh, but that these three did die for their faith, and the historical evidence shows that, is agreed upon by unbelieving and believing uh, scholars alike. Oh, and I did want to say, too, there are two others we do have good evidence for what happened to them. James, the, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee, right? He was actually the first of the twelve to be martyred. That's recorded in Acts chapter 12. I trust that because I think the book of Acts is trustworthy, and I've given reasons for that in another uh, uh, lecture, talking about the trustworthiness of the author Luke. So I trust that, but many scholars don't. They think Acts you know, is fabrications, and so we can't trust it. But that would be the first disciple to die for his faith. Uh, Herod Agrippa I uh, chopped his head off, and that's in Acts chapter 12, the first few verses. And then the other one would be the Apostle John. He didn't die as a martyr. He died as a very old man. This is the unanimous testimony of the early church. In fact, the, the strong evidence for this is also the apostolic fathers, people who were writing around 80, 90 to about 140 A.D. Some of them say, I know John. You know, I was discipled by him. He's still alive. And so we have good, strong, early evidence from many different sources that John did live very long and very late. Um, maybe even in, you know, probably into his hundreds, possibly. Um, so we do know what happened to John and James. And then these other three, I think we have solid evidence that they were actually martyred. They actually died as believers. And it was because they were believers that they died. James, the brother of Jesus, Peter, and Paul. Okay? Let's look at the evidence. First, we know that these three individuals in particular, and this is very interesting, Peter, James, the brother of Jesus, I have to distinguish them, so you know I'm not talking about James, the son of Zebedee. James, the brother of Jesus, Jesus uh, Peter, and Paul all believed that Jesus appeared to, the, appeared to them after he was crucified, risen from the dead. They all believed that. And why, do, not just I say that, Ehrman says that. In fact, I brought E.P. Sanders, who uh, wrote, this is one of the, the top of the historical Jesus books, and E.P. Sanders is one of the top. He's not a conservative scholar at all. And he's one of the most uh, well-respected historical Jesus guys, the new perspective on Paul, if you've heard of that. But he, in the beginning of this book, this is about the mid-1900s, he basically says, okay, there are some things about Jesus' life that just about over these last 300 years of Jesus scholarship, we, there's a consensus on. There are some things that we can say, as good as we can say something historically, this is true about the historical Jesus. And one of those things, he says, and you can come afterwards and read these things, one of them is that the disciples, after Jesus, uh, his crucifixion, sometime after his crucifixion, they saw him in what sense is not certain after his death. And so E.P. Sanders testifies that one of the things that, that, that there's consensus on is that these dis early disciples, people like Peter, people like James, they believed that Jesus appeared to them. They were convinced that that was true. Okay? And, the, and the main reason for that, just to give you the main evidence for that, is this great text from 1 Corinthians 15, which I've shared before, I'm not going to get into the arguments now, but this tradition that Paul, te that, that Paul quotes here in 1 Corinthians 15, this goes back, and once again, this is not debated, it goes back to three to five years after Jesus' crucifixion. So, I mean, this is early, early, early testimony, three to five years after Jesus' crucifixion. John Dominique Crossan, if you go if you watch uh, William Lane Craig and John Dominique Crossan's debate, he agrees with this. Every, I mean, this, is, this is about unanimous. And what does this say? It says what Paul delivered to the Corinthians when he planted the church, he received, and we believe he received it when he went to Jerusalem about three to five years after Jesus' crucifixion. This is what he received, this tradition. It says Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He appeared to Cephas. If you don't know, that's the Aramaic name for Peter. 
<coughs> then to the twelve, after that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of who remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Some are still alive, Paul says. You can go interview them. You can go talk to them. But so, uh, then he appeared to James. This is talking about the brother of Jesus. And then to the, all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. Paul says, he appeared to me. And here's what's fascinating about this uh, list. The only three people that are specifically individually named are the three people that we happen to just have the most overwhelming evidence for that not only, as it testifies here, did they believe that Jesus appeared to them, but also that they died maintaining that faith. They died for that faith. Okay, They died believing that Jesus was the Son of God and that he rose again from the dead. Does that make sense? Any questions on that thus far? There, there were a lot of Christian persecutions, regardless of what uh, Miss, Miss Moss, Doc, Dr. Moss says. Uh, there were a lot of Christian persecutions by the emperors in Rome for the first 300 years. There were some key ones. There, there definitely is exaggeration among Christians that like, they were hunting down Christians every day. That's not the case. They were sporadic. They were, they were uh, varied, and there were certain ones that are way worse than others. But of all the, the persecutions, the one that, that we, we need to focus on is the one under Emperor Nero. And if you don't know about Emperor Nero, he reigned, he was the emperor of Rome from 50, I think 54 AD to, to 68, okay? So he reigned from about 54 to 68. And why he's important is because the testimony we get from, all the, from, from some of these evidences of when these disciples were martyred, people like Peter and James and, and, and Paul, they all were martyred under Nero at, at, when he reigned. And Peter and Paul specifically were probably martyred because of Nero's uh, orders to basically hunt down the Christians and kill them. He did do that. And what's our evidence for this? Well, it's not just from the Bible. This is from Tacitus. Sorry, it's a lot. I'll just read a little bit of it. I won't read all of it. But this is the key text from Tacitus, who was a Roman historian. He's writing about AD 117. And he testifies that Nero, you know, set this fire. There was this huge fire in Rome. And he says, you know, in other places that, you know, Nero was probably, he's a, he was a wild man. He was probably drunk or something and set the place on fire. And then he blamed the fire on the Christians. He said the Christians did it. And as a result, he said, go get the Christians and let's, let's kill them. Let's punish them for setting this fire. And so uh, Tacitus tells us this. And he says, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class of hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty under the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurator, Pontius Pilate, a most mischievous superstition, probably talking about the resurrection, thus checked for the moment, again broke out, not only in Judea, the first source of evil, but even in Rome. And then it says, um, accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty, then upon their information, an immense multitude, that's a key phrase, an immense multitude, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. And then it says they were covered with the skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished, they were nailed to crosses, and they were uh, doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as nightly illumination when daylight had expired. So these Christians were nailed to, to, to stakes, nailed to crosses, set on fire, so that way at night the soldiers had light to, to, to help them see as they uh, rode down the road. So pretty, pretty rough stuff, and this is what Tacitus says. And it's that immense multitude, many Christians during this time, and this is about 64 to 66, uh, 64 to 67 A.D., about around that time is when all this happened. So could, it, could Peter and Paul be a part of that immense multitude? The early Christians, the early evidence that we have does say that they were martyred under this reign. And so they do fit the, the, the evidence outside the New Testament, Tacitus. And the other one is from Suetonius. Him, him and Tacitus aren't together. They're writing at separate times. Uh, they're writing around, around the same time, but they're, but they're distinct. And he's, he's also telling the story about what happened with Nero. And he says, after the great fire at Rome, punishments were also inflicted on the Christians, a sect professing a new and mischievous religious belief. Probably, this is the way the Romans refer to as, you know, the fact that they're saying that this dead man Jesus rose again from the dead, as we even see in the book of Acts. You know, they look at this, this absurd claim. This is ridiculous. And I brought some of the books, but, you know, 
some of the, some of the top scholars on this, you know, say like Justo Gonzalez. He's one of the top um, historians of Christianity. He says it's very likely that both Peter and Paul were among the Ner Neronian martyrs in his uh, story of Christianity, which is two volumes um, that, that they forced us to read it at seminary. But um, Oscar Coleman wrote pretty much the definitive work on Peter. And uh, basically, it's the ultimate scholarly work on the life of Peter from the Gospels, from his letters, and, his, his, uh, and ultimate his death. And he make, makes clear that we have the highest probability that Peter and Paul were martyred in Rome very soon after another, one another. We don't know when, but they were martyred sometime around that. Uh, well, I think in the last slide of the slide before that, uh, talking about Tacitus, it said 119, mm -hmm. I think AD 119. So he was, I don't know when he was born, but I assume that he would have been pretty young around that time of the Great Fire. Right. Like super young, maybe a little kid. How would he have gotten that information? Did he, is that a first-hand account or a second-hand account? Well, he's a Roman historian. So he would have had access to all the information about the emperors, same as Suetonius. They would have probably kept pretty good records of the emperors and the events that happened during those times. So Nero would have allowed them to write down any official record that he set a fire to the city and then lied about it? Well, um... I feel like he would say, no, don't write it that way. Yeah, there was probably other... I, we don't know all their sources. See, this gets back to the sources. We don't know his sources, we just know uh, most scholars trust Tacitus that this was historically accurate. But where would he have gotten that information if he wasn't there? But he, he was, was there when he was young, right? He was there, he, was, he would have been young at that time, but, but there were probably other people that were there that said that he talked to and that had, there was probably writings and other people he probably knew that were old at this time that might have been around that time. And they said, hey, Nero blamed it on the Christians. It really wasn't them. I can get back, I mean, that would be a good study of Tacitus and his sources. I'm, I'm not an expert on that, but, uh, but I just know, you know, people who cite Tacitus, especially on that account, you know, they, they don't say, oh, well, we can't trust him on that. You know, they, they generally, you know, agree that it's trustworthy. And the fact that Suetonius, on a separate account, you know, they're not in, in you know, collusion in any way. They're both testifying about this great fire in Rome and things. But that's a great question. And so what are the early evidences? Let's talk about Peter specifically. Well, I would say the earliest would be his own letter, 2 Peter, where he actually says, he's clearly in a prison, he's, in, he's about to be martyred, he says, and he says this, I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. Now, most who study 2 Peter would say, Peter, whoever wrote this is saying, Peter's about to be martyred. The problem is, is many scholars don't think Peter wrote 2 Peter. In fact, they would say 2 Peter was written uh, early 2nd century, maybe to mid 2nd century. So we don't have real strong, I, I think it was written by, by Peter, and there's, I think there's real good reasons for that. But the fact that many scholars don't think that, it's not the best place to start. So let's start at the, the best place that it does have universal, pretty much universal agreement. And it actually comes from the Gospel of John, coincidentally. The Gospel of John is our earliest witness and almost just solid teaching and tradition that, Jesus, that Peter was crucified and martyred. And this is what it says. This is what Jesus says in John 21, after he's risen from the dead. It says, I tell you the truth, when you were younger, he's talking to Peter, and you dressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you were old, you will stretch out your hands, which is a, a Martin Hangel wrote pretty much the definitive work on crucifixion. And he makes clear and shows n numerous references of this time. Stretch out your hands. This is talking about crucifixion. This is an allusion to crucifixion. And someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said, and then in case you don't realize that, the author makes it very clear. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to me, him, follow me. Now here's what's cool about that. For, let me show you why this is so historically accurate and, and people all agree. Like what Coleman says, it's almost universally recognized that these words are intended as a prediction of the martyrdom of Peter. I think J Jesus actually said that. I think John is actually giving us an accurate report of what Jesus said and, and gave a prophecy that Peter would be martyred. But, but here's the thing. Take the liberal stance, which is the, the author of this, who may not even have been John, made this up and put it on the lips of Jesus. Even if that's the case, they're not going to put on the lips of Jesus something that didn't happen. Because, see, the Gospel of John 
is dated to 8090 by all scholars, conservative and liberal. So this happened about, uh, this was written about 20 to 30 years after the events that, where we believe uh, Peter was martyred. So they wouldn't put on the lips of Jesus a prophecy that didn't happen. So whoever wrote John was absolutely convinced that Peter was crucified. You see that? You see why that's so strong? That, that's, that's why this is the earliest and really the best uh, attest, uh, testimony that Peter was crucified uh, for Jesus, following in his footsteps. Which is interesting when you study John, by the way. You know, I've been preaching through John at our church. Jesus said to, to Peter, um, when, Jesus, when Peter said, I'm gonna lay my, I will lay, lay down my life for you. And Jesus said, Amen, I say to you, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Here, he says, Amen, I say to you, you will die for me. Now, now, you, now, you, now it's time. Now that I died for you, now you can die for me. You can't have the other way around. So it's kind of cool how you have that. Peter ends up fulfilling what he really wanted, to, you know, what he said he would do back in the upper room discourse. There was something else I was going to say on that. Let's see what's next. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so, and around the same time, around the same time when the Gospel of John was written, probably a little after, this letter called First Clement. Clement was a bishop of Rome, and he's writing in AD 90 a letter to, the, to uh, the Corinthian church, that same Corinthian church that Paul planted. This is a part of what's known as the Apostolic Fathers. I have that here too. It's very, very bottom. And he testifies that Peter uh, was martyred. He doesn't say he was crucified. But he says, there was Peter who, because of unrighteous jealousy, endured not one, but two, but many trials, and thus having given his testimony, went to his appointed place of glory. And if you study this section in 1 Clement 5, it's a list of martyrs. Clement is, is, is basically illustrating with Peter, and he talks about Paul. I'll show that in a second. And he gives all these examples of martyrdom and how they went to their appointed place of glory. And so here you have, outside of the New Testament, outside of John, basically both testifying to the same thing. And, and Clement was in Rome. He was in a place where he could know, where he, he would know this information. And Irenaeus, of course, he's much later. But this, this, I'll just give you, I just show you this because this is basically what is said. And this becomes like the, the, the normal speaking of the early, of the early church fathers. Uh, by this time, they start talking about Peter and Paul together and talking about how they, how they both died at Rome. And we get legends at this point. So, like uh, St. Augustine says, they died on the same day. You know, they, may, they, they just make it even better. Than, than, you know, they, they add legend to it. But the historical core that they did die in this Neronian persecution, we don't know how far apart, we don't know uh, everything about it, but that they did die at that time. Peter was crucified. Paul was most likely beheaded because he was a Roman citizen. Is, is, is pretty strong. Oh, and then, so that Peter was crucified, I think is very strong, especially because of John 21. But how uh, did, did he get crucified upside down? Have you all heard that tradition? See, that's a famous thing that Peter asked to be crucified upside down so that way uh, he, wouldn't, he, he wouldn't imitate his Lord exactly. You know, he, wouldn't, he didn't feel worthy to be crucified as his Lord was crucified. Well, that's probably legend. It could have happened, but it's probably legend because it comes so much later. It, it appears first in the Acts of Peter, which is this apocryphal writing that, that's dated about 150 A.D., and this is what it, you know, it's, it's in King James language, but you notice with the head downward, that's where it first used. Eusebius testifies to this. He's quoting Origen, the early church father Origen, and he says, finally he came to Rome and was crucified head downward at his own request. That's where we first uh, get that kind of language, and that's third century. Uh, Eusebius is fourth century, but he's quoting Origen, if, he, if that's correct, and then that would be third century. But here's uh, just a fun fact. Seneca if you don't know who Seneca was, you know, a uh, Roman philosopher. He was actually uh, Nero's tutor. So he was right at the same time of when this persecution happened. And he testifies that he saw some hang their victims with head toward the ground. So he testifies to the fact that people were crucified upside down in the Roman Empire. So, so he could have been. But we don't have any of that. We don't have the, the information until 2nd, 3rd century. Uh, saying that. But it's pretty cool that a Roman writer basically says, yeah, I've seen people crucified upside down. That, 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 is, that does happen. So that's Peter. Any, any questions on that? Any comments or thoughts? Well, let's talk about Paul. 
Like, like with Peter, we have the same kind of issue because I think the earliest testimony would be Paul's last letter, which is 2 Timothy, which the tradition says he was in prison. He was in Rome and he was about to await his uh, standing before Nero and he would be beheaded. And he makes that clear in the, in the letter. He says, I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time has come for my departure. See that departure, that's the same word Peter used in 2 Peter. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. See, all this martyrdom language. Now, once again, we have this problem. Most scholars, many scholars, most conservative scholars don't think this, but probably the majority of scholars who write and, and do things on 1st, 2nd Timothy, 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, Titus would say Paul didn't write those. These are, these are the, the, the three letters that are least um, accredited to Paul. They, they think a, a disciple wrote it or something like that, and it was written maybe in the early... 2nd century or mid 2nd century. I don't think that. I think Paul wrote it. But that's, that's what generally is said. He said three books. 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, and Titus. They call that the pastoral letters. They seem to have been written by the same. Whoever wrote it, they agree, wrote all three of them. But they would, many would say Paul didn't write those, though. They're, they're, they're written under the authority of Paul and, um, you know, by people who definitely... Uh, love Paul and considered Paul great, and but the, the, one of the good arguments that they that he did write is because the early church is so crazy against pseudonymous letters. So we do have evidence of the early church in the second century. And if I ever did a talk on the canon, I would discuss this. They found out people that like there's this one letter called Third Corinthians, and uh, this guy claimed Paul wrote it, but he really didn't. And the early church found out about it. They expelled him from the church. And they probably burned the letter. See, they, 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 they considered it a big deal. And so they were very serious about making sure these letters were actually written by who it said it was written by. And that's, that's why the book of Revelation took so long to get put into the canon, by the way, because they weren't sure John wrote it. And, and that's true of some of the other letters that were questioned early on. But that's a separate issue. So this would be the earliest if Paul did write this. But if it's not, then Clement's the earliest, but that's still 80-90, remember? It's, that it's, it's still 90 A.D., and uh, Clement says this about Paul. Finally, when he had given his testimony, notice he uses that same word with Peter, his testimony, before the rulers, he thus departed from the world and went to the holy place, having become an outstanding example of patient endurance. All right, so he doesn't say he's beheaded. He doesn't say uh, uh, some of the later information, but testifies that Paul, around the same time as Peter, was um, martyred. And uh, Oscar Coleman, I quote that again. He, he says, Peter and Paul martyred in Rome. High probability. F.F. Bruce, and probably if you want to read a book on Paul, this is one of the best ever written. It's called The Apostle of the Heart Set Free. It's probably the best like biography of Paul and, and just discussing him and uh, all that he did. And he says in here, the most that can safely be said is that Clement bears witness to Paul's death at Rome under Nero. And F.F. Bruce is a conservative scholar, but he's very fair. I mean, if you study him, he's not going to say, it's safely said unless he's really convinced of, of the evidence. And so he's, a, he's a, I think, a very trustworthy scholar. And then by the time of Eusebius, they're mentioning the beheading. And, and whether he was beheaded or not, most likely he was because he was a Roman citizen. A Roman citizen wouldn't be crucified. A Roman citizen would, would receive, uh, as, as Maximus said in Gladiator, a clean death, right? A clean death. Um, so it says it is related that in his reign Paul was beheaded in Rome itself and that Peter was also crucified. And the cemeteries there still called by the names of Peter and Paul confirmed the record. So kind of the uh, evidence for Paul. And, and, you know, of all the three, honestly, if there was one that the vast majority would say, yeah, Paul did, you know, that one did die for his faith, it would be Paul. I mean, Paul has the strongest going for him because we have his firsthand testimony in his early letters. The fact that he said, last of all, the Lord appeared to me. We don't have just a secondhand testimony like he appeared to Cephas. He appeared to James. We have he appeared to me. This is a firsthand testimony by Paul. And, you know, if you know Paul, if you study the letters, I mean, I, don't, I, think, I think it's more reasonable to think that Paul died saying Jesus is Lord than not. <laughs> I don't think anybody's going to say Paul wimped out in the end. I doubt that, especially scholars trust 2 Corinthians was written by Paul and how he was beaten and beaten by rods and he was stoned and all these things happened to him and he still got back up and, you know, 
talked about Jesus. So I don't think he, he wimped out in the end. I really don't. But so the last one would be James. This is the brother of Jesus. Obviously, they say half brother because this would be the elder brother, um, elder of the other brothers, born of Joseph and Mary after uh, Jesus was born. Jesus uh, believed to be virgin born. But the interesting thing about James is like Paul, he was an unbeliever by the New Testament's accounts. Multiple different sources say James was not a believer in Jesus during his public ministry. And so, for example, in Mark chapter 3, it says, Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He's out of his mind. He's out of his mind. And then later on in that chapter, it said, Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. And this is, if you study the Gospel of Mark, you find out those on the outside, it's, it's those on the outside he speaks parables to. He conceals the truth from them. The outside is language of, basically, they're, they're kind of on the outside right now. And so, uh, you get this idea early in Jesus' ministry, his family was pretty uncomfortable with what he was doing. They didn't really understand it completely. Later, they did come to follow him, but how did that happen? In John 7 also, we have the direct statement that his brothers didn't believe in him. In John 7, it says, after this, Jesus went around in Galilee purposely staying away from Judea because the Jews were waiting to take his life. But when the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near, Jesus' brother said to him, you ought to leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. No one who wants to become a public figure act a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. Even his own brothers did not believe in him, John tells us. So it's, it's, it's the common tradition that the brothers did not believe in him, and James would have been the top most well-known brother. But then, in the early chapter of Acts, after Jesus has died, risen again, ascended into heaven, according to Luke and Acts, it tells us, when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room. This is, they're waiting on the Holy Spirit to come upon them, right? And it says, those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. James was there. Jude was there. Judas was there. What happened? Why suddenly the belief? Why suddenly following Jesus? Why is he suddenly with the disciples? Well, Paul, I think, testifies to it in Corinthians 15. He appeared to James. He appeared to James. It's just, you know, how many of y'all have brothers and sisters? What would it take for you to be convinced that your brother or sister was God in the flesh? <laughs> it might, maybe if they were killed in some horrific, violent way in front of you, and then they came back in a glorious way to you later, and explain the situation to you, that might, that might do it. That might do it. Garrett? Just a little atheist commentary. Another thing that would convince me that my brother had some magical powers were if my parents told me that at his birth, uh, shepherds came and worshipped him and that a star guided wise men to him, and that <clears throat> then they popped some gold, silver, and myrrh out of the closet and showed it to me. So these are the gifts that the wise men brought your brave baby brother. But don't you think it cost some money to go back from Bethlehem back to uh, Nazareth? Don't you think it cost some money? Uh, it might have, but yeah. the story... There's, there's traveling expenses, Garrett. The story alone that is, is my, that just as a passing commentary, I would just like to point out that it's only in Mark and John that we have stories about Jesus' family being skeptical of him. Uh, and those That's are two also, sources. Those are also the Gospels that don't have birth narratives, just as a little commentary there. That's an interesting point. But yeah, and, and, and just, you know, and, and kids don't always believe what, believe what their mothers tell them, you know. I think that's another thing. She might have told him, or she might have felt the, you know, humility, the, the hey, I need to keep this stuff quiet. We don't know. But either way, yeah, she, it says she treasured it in, in her heart. But, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting point. The whole thing is kind of weird. I mean, if your brother was perfect, like that, whole, that whole idea is pretty, yeah. pretty crazy. Like, if your baby, if your brother was literally perfect, like, that guy never does anything wrong. You know? like, <laughs> well, how, how, do you know that, how do you know they didn't have that problem? Maybe that's one of the reasons why they didn't believe him. Maybe that's one of the reasons why they, uh, they were angry at him. Just, Think of the uh, jealousy that factor there with that, right? <laughs> Why can't you be like your brother? And all that? <laughs> <laughs>
What were you going to say? I was just going to ask. Uh, I thought that like what we knew from the Gospels that like the wise men came and visited him like when he was a younger, like two years old or something like that. Like, yeah. When he was born as a baby. I mean, when he was uh, it's yeah, because there's, the, like the traditional narrative is not. Yeah, there's debate. The the <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, there so, could have been a two-year separation yeah. between that, yeah. but but yeah, there's there's people on different sides of that, but but okay. yeah. And and so, what about James? How do we know? Here's the cool thing about James. This isn't from the New Testament. The New Testament doesn't even tell us what happened to James, the brother of Jesus. Guess what? It's Josephus that tells us what happened to James. A Jewish historian, not a Christian, unbiased. He's got nothing to gain from this. And so this is what he says about James. Festus was now dead, and Albanus was but upon the road. So he assembled the Sanhedrin of judges and brought before... What time is it, by the way? I want to make sure. 9.23. 9.23? Okay. We're, we're good. Uh, and he brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, what do you think these fellow Jews were accusing James of, of being a breaker of the law? Probably a very similar thing as the Jews were always calling Jesus a breaker of the law. They were probably accusing him of blasphemy. They probably were ticked off that he was following this Jesus of Nazareth, saying he was risen from the dead, saying he was the Messiah, but also that he gained so many followers in Jerusalem because we're, we're told by other sources that James gathered quite a few uh, followers uh, from the Jews uh, to become believers in Jesus in Jerusalem. Paul testifies to that in Galatians. And they delivered him to be stoned. And so Josephus testifies basically that he was stoned to death. And we have later early Christian testimony uh, after Josephus. They then get, you see, see, this is a great, this is what's cool when Josephus tells us something that he's got nothing to gain by it because then when you look at what the, like Eusebius says, you see this kind of legendary, you know, and, and praiseworthy things added to it that shows that, hey, Josephus has probably given us the, you know, the hard data, the historical data, and Eusebius is maybe adding some flair to it, you see. And this is why, uh, this is from the Harvard Loeb series on Josephus. It's a really cool series where you have the, the original language, the Greek of Josephus on one side, the English on the other, and they got notes at the bottom. And this is what he says at the notes here on this passage. He says, few have doubted the genuineness of this passage on James. If it had been a Christian interpolation, it would, in all probability, have been more laudatory of James, which is exactly what we see when Eusebius talks about it. I won't read them all here, but like, for example, uh, Eusebius says here, when he was killed, look what happened. He turned and he knelt down and said, I implore you, O Lord God and Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And so Eusebius puts in, the, in his mouth what Jesus said on the cross, what Stephen said when he was being stoned. So you see this, exactly what that scholar said, a more laudatory uh, picture of James. But Josephus testifies that he did die for his faith. James, he appeared to James, it says, and then it says he died um, believing that his brother was the Son of God. And so let me just close with saying, if Peter, Paul, and James really died for their faith in Jesus, like I said, they were either liars, they were deluded, deluded maniacs, or they're telling the truth. But I think we can eliminate the first. I think most reasonable thinking people would eliminate the first. No one has ever and ever will die for something they know to be false. They know for certain to be false, which, like I said, is different than the 9-11 hijackers, different than if I were to die for my faith, different than Dietrich Bonhoeffer. They were in a place to know whether it was true or not. And so the, it leads to the other two options. Either they're telling the truth or they were deluded. They were just tricked. It was a great hoax. They, they thought he appeared. It was a hallucination, you know, something like that. But they were convinced, ultimately, by giving their life. But I think what they said in the book of Acts, this Jesus whom you crucified, God raised him from the dead and we are all witnesses of this. I think that's exactly what, I think that's exactly what happened. I think we have very good reasons to believe that. And just to close with a great word from one of my favorite guys, Blaise, Blaise Pascal. He said, the apostles were either deceived or deceivers if Jesus didn't really rise. Either supposition is difficult, for it is not possible to imagine that a man has risen from the dead. That's hard to do. While Jesus was with them, he could sustain them. But afterwards, if he did not appear to them, who did make them act? If he was a dead Messiah, who made them act? What caused this explosion? And then not just that, but what caused 
these men to die, these at least particular three, Peter, Paul, and James, what caused them to die to give their lives for this? What did that? What made them act? I think it's a, it's a, a question for the ages. And then, as Christosom says, the, the, this great early church father, this would be the greatest of miracles that without any miracles, the whole world should have eagerly come to be taken in the nets of 12 poor and illiterate men. That, that's the greatest of miracles if there were no miracles. So all this came from ultimately nothing. There, it was all a trick in some way. It was a hoax. It was, it was magic. It was, it was an illusion, right? That would be the greatest of miracles. I love that point. So if Jesus of Nazareth did in fact rise from the dead and he was who he claimed to be, I challenge you to call upon his name. He's still alive. And you'll say, when you, when you meet him, you'll say like Thomas when he met him, my Lord and my God.